as my former colleague Sean Alshadi would start these shows. And I'm going to look at the camera this time because I can't tell you how many people commented that I don't look at the camera enough because I'm always looking at uh, the questions, my Skype, and not at the camera. So I'm looking at the camera this time. But, of course, this is Jose Youngs. Joining me this week on the A-Side over here at MMAfighting.com is my very good friend, Anthony Walker of Sure Dog. He's been on the show before, but that was, as Esther Lynn calls it, the extra live A-Side live chat when we're both there in the same room together. But Anthony Walker is making his debut the via the magic of Skype. Edition. The exclusive Anthony Walker, live from L.A. He's joining us via Skype. I'm gl- great to have He was supposed to be on a few times before. Things, guests, and whatnot kind of threw a wrench into that but he is here with us so anthony welcome back how you been since the last time we saw you i believe it was ufc 239 fight week yeah then 239 fight week man happy to be back uh, always a, a pleasure chatting with you we always have a good time when we get to kick it so it, it's always fun to, to talk uh people getting punched in the face for money with with some friends so so let's get the show on the road my man I think we saw each other at the Dominance MMA Media Day, too. That was a good time. You had, I heard, an uh, exhilarating interview yeah. with one Mike Tyson, if I remember correctly. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. You, you cut out for just a second there. Yeah. Ain't nothing, but, uh, man. Yeah. The magic yeah. of internet. But I heard we, we saw you at the Dominance MMA Media Day. I heard you had an absolutely riveting interview with one Mike Tyson, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I did get to talk to Mike Tyson, man. That was that was pretty cool. Like, like that was one of those moments you have to control your inner fanboy. <laughs> right. And, uh, Mike Tyson blowing weed smoke in my face the whole time. That's uh that's a bucket list thing. My, my actually, dad thought that was really cool. Did he actually answer your questions? Yeah, he did. He just didn't really give good answers. Yeah. Like, so I'm asking him about a bunch of fights. He's like, Yeah, I didn't even get to watch that fight. Like, okay. Well, um, thanks Thank- for letting us uh, be here, Mike. And um. Weed smells great. Take care. Yeah. Weed smells great. Take care. But all right, as always, this is the A Side Live Chat. This is not not our podcast. This is your guys' podcast. So leave a question in the comment section of the post. It's been tweeted out. It's sticky at the top of the site, or you can use hashtag the A Side on Twitter. Of course, people are probably listening to this after the fact. You can always come and ask questions and then listen to it later on. You can use go on Twitter. You can go on the site. It's going to be on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, all that fun stuff. But Anthony, we're going to get right into it. From Grin N, longtime commenter. Yes, sir. What are your thoughts on the upcoming fight between Corey Sandhagen and Frank Edgar? How do you see this matchup unfolding if Edgar isn't victorious? What what does that signal for him and his career? So yes, Anthony. This week it is official. Frank mm-hmm. Edgar will make his long awaited debut at the 135 pound division against Corey Sandhagen, I believe, at UFC Raleigh, not in the main event, in the co main event couple things to unpack there. Uh, I remember when Frankie first dropped down to 145, he immediately fought Jose Aldo right away. And then he, he came up short, and then he fought Charles Oliveira. And I think, believe it was the co-main event at UFC 162. That was the Anderson, Chris Wyden in the first one. Uh, but now he's dropping down to 135 pounds. There is a lot of high-level marquee hunt, bantamweight fights in the pipe war. In Coming up, we got Jose Aldo is fighting Marlon Moraes. We got Uriah Faber uh, fighting Peter Yan. Um, Dominic Cruz is floating around out there. Alzheimer Sterling just went under the knife. Now Frank Yeager's there, 135. Henry Cejudo still recovering. But what do you make of Frank Yeager's future, 135 pounds, his shot against Corey Sanhagen, and what happens if he comes up short? What does that say for the answer's uh, future inside the octagon? Man, I was definitely surprised by the Corey Sanhagen fight. Like, I like the fight. I think from a technical standpoint, that's a fun fight. That's a fight that I will have a lot of lot of fun trying to dissect and, and, and dig into the X's and O's of it. Ha- obviously has a lot of divisional relevance. The The only thing that shocked me was that Corey Sanhagen isn't exactly a marquee name. Right. Now, while guys like us respect him, uh, the people out there listening in the chat right now, they respect Corey Sanhagen, but he's not a name that that strikes some casual interest. Like Frankie might be able to. So I figured when you would like the way you framed it uh, leading into the question was perfect. Like when he dropped to 145, his first fight was against Jose Aldo. Like his his fight was against the greatest featherweight of all time. And now I would think I would I, with that in mind, I would think that they would have given him a more name value guy, which I thought the Aljamain Sterling fight was perfect for that. Uh, you know, uh, Aljo just seemed perfect, but obviously, um, you know, his his health issues ha- have have delayed that potential matchup. Now, as far as if Frankie doesn't come out victorious, man, I 
I'm not really sure if we can make a whole lot of it because it would be his first fight at, at Bantamweight. We don't know how his body reacts to the to that weight cut. We haven't really seen him cut weight before. Right. We've seen him just kind of walk in as is. This would be his first time cutting weight. Maybe he needs a second go round to to optimize his body in 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 that in that uh division. Um but of course if he loses, you know, he's not exactly the youngest guy in the world and he's fighting one of the the best in the division. So it might signal the end for Frankie Edgar, but I I say we still need one more to be uh, for sure on that. Yeah, I'm real I like you said, I love this fight. Surprised by the book the matchmaking, surprised at the cards being placed on because we do have that big card in January, we have that big card in February and to put it on I believe it is the Raleigh card if I'm not mistaken, right? I'm not making so, that up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have supposedly that Houston card in February. Supposedly have that big Conor McGregor card in January. Maybe Frankie doesn't want to fight on the same card as Conor McGregor if they're not fighting. Who knows? Uh, but I love the matchmaking. It's just, it's. I've always wanted to see Frankie Edgar versus Dominic Cruz. That's been a, in the pipe dream of mm-hmm. mine ever since. They remember they had that championship champions um, like gathering they had all the champions up on stage I believe yeah it was, it was for that that international fight week before the gsp shields pay-per-view and frank edgar and dominic cruz are sitting right next to each other they didn't look that much like dominic cruz looked like the same size as him so i've always wanted that fight Corey sanhagen is on record saying like dominic cruz is his idol and he kind of mirrors his fighting style off of dominic cruz so maybe this is the next best thing i don't know uh, I wish it was a five rounder. Uh, maybe Frankie wants to see how his body reacts to actually, like you said, this is really the first time we've seen him cut weight. He would just walk into the octagon 155 pounds, cut maybe eight or seven pounds to fight at 145, and now he has to actually cut weight at 135. Uh, I spoke to him. I don't know. I don't know if you had a chance to speak to Frank Edgar at the Dominance MMA Media Day, but I asked him point blank because like he wants yeah, to got, fight. I got to speak to him there too. He wants to fight Conor McGregor. That was what he wanted to do at any weight, 155, 145, 170, 165. He wanted to fight Conor McGregor. He's, I asked him, is there a timetable you're going to have? Because if you want to cut to 135, I'm sure you're going to want to actually go through the whole process and not have to bulk up to fight Conor and then immediately cut to 135. And he said his, his timeline was probably going to be around December, November. We're now pretty deep into November. Thanksgiving is right around the corner. So the time... the the announcement doesn't surprise me in terms of when it happens. The opponent surprised me, and the card surprised me. But I absolutely love this fight. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I, but I, 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 again, I want to see how Frankie looks before I can make a prediction on that one. Yeah, I agree, man. We we gotta we gotta see something to uh, to kind of know what to make of of his uh, potential future bantamweight run. So I'm all in, man. This this is like I said. This is a fight for the people who really like fighting. Right. This is this is not just okay a, a sexy name on the billboard. Although the Dominic Cruz fight, that yeah, that that's that sounds that sounds fire right there. I wouldn't mind that one either. And the th- the fact that the champion Henry Cejudo is still on the shelf, recovering from like I believe it was shoulder or elbow surgery or whatever, and he's traveling all over the world doing fan Q and A's, guest fighter spots, this and that. Like I said, I named all those Bantamweight fights coming up. Like, if Jose Aldo wins, he said he's going to wait for Henry Cejudo. Uh, Frank Edgar wins. You imagine he'd want to fight Henry, Ce- Henry Cejudo. And then Cody, Gar- I spoke to Cody Garbrandt at Dominance MMA Media. He wants to come back in March, so then you're going to throw his name into the mix too. Uriah Faber, like him, like... The Bantamweight division is is fantastic right now, and the champion is hurt, and there's so many, like, Aljamain Sterling should fight for the championship. Peter Jan should fight for the championship. Jose Aldo. Like, Matt, if Marlon Moraes goes out there and beats Jose Aldo, what happens? He's not fighting Henry again, so the Bant- we could do a whole episode of the A-side just on the Bantamweight division. But of those, all these matchups, this isn't part of the question, but I'm, I'm curious to get your take. Of all those matchups I said, which mm. which one are you most looking forward to? And if I if I had to choose one name, if you had to choose one name to fight Henry Cejudo next, who are you choosing? I got to go Aljo. Um, Aljo just, I, I like the, the the technical improvements he's made as, as of late. I mean, the, the big knock on him before recently was like, yeah, he could kick, he could wrestle. It was like this weird hybrid style. Right. It was almost like, almost reminded me of Phil Davis, kind of the, the, the way he would, he would approach a fight. But his hands have looked a lot better lately, a whole lot better. And I'm just very curious to see what his wrestling matches up against Henry Cejudo's wrestling, what that striking looks like, what the, the physical dimensions of their bodies looks like uh, against one another. Like, Aljo was, is definitely one of the, the more athletic guys at Bantamweight as well. So I want to see how that plays out against an Olympic caliber athlete. Like, there, there are so many little things about Aljo versus Cejudo that, that make it very intriguing to me. And then from a personality standpoint, 
those they're they're two probably the most um the most outrageous personalities in the division as well the build-up of that fight will probably be a lot of fun too and let's not forget rob fonts also fighting ricky simone so there's another bantamweight you can throw into this this chaos i know aljamain sterling has always really wanted to fight cody garbrandt like very badly i spoke to him backstage in ufc phoenix he's like I don't care if Cody Garbrandt wins or loses. I'm fighting that guy next. So maybe if uh, if Cody wants to come back in March, Aljamain's uh, healthy again. And he wants like a three round fight coming coming off surgery. Maybe we book that fight finally because, like I said, there's so many bantamweight fights all in this two month span. And maybe Aljamain has fights one more time before fighting for the championship. Don't hate that Cody Garbrandt fight whatsoever. The history is there. They don't seem to really care for each other. I spoke. I don't like. You, did you speak to Cody at that media day? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't dig Cody there. But he seemed much more ev- like relaxed and even keeled than angry Cody we've come to know before his fights against CJ Loso. So maybe we see a different Cody Garbrandt. Who knows? Uh, but again, like I said we could do a whole episode on the bantamweight division. But we're going to move right along from longtime commenter Lodovic. Few good things from UFC Sao Paulo. I don't even want to think about the whole card, but Charles Oliveira and Randy Brown certainly delivered. Where do you see their positions in their divisions and what's next for them? Thanks as always. So yes, Anthony Walker, I don't know if you saw... Any of UFC pa- Sao Paulo. It was kind of a grind. It was kind of a grind. It, it, a was, lot of- it felt like work. It, it felt like work for one of the rare times. It was It was work. It was work. Uh, I can't imagine. This seems to be like... Since the ESPN deal kind of came, came into fruition, there hasn't been a lot of... Uh, duds i should say of pacing and this feels like it's been going on forever because you remember the fox era where cards could take uh, like unfortunately seven hours long we didn't get that with espn this card felt like it took forever to finish and then the main event uh there were obviously finishes but there were also a lot of decisions like the jacques Ray and, and jan blakovitz fight and those first few fights on the on the the prelims but charles Oliver submits uh, uh uh jared flash gordon i believe it moves him within one away from tying cowboy cerrone uh for most sub- stoppage wins in the history of the ufc i believe just charles Oliver might have the most submission wins already like submissions wins in general Picks up another performance of the night bonus. I believe it's his fifth or sixth win in a row. All stoppages, all bonuses, blah, blah, blah. Randy Brown goes out there. Uh, who did, oh my God, I'm just flat. I'm blanking on who he just beat. But uh, wow, this is going to drive me absolutely. Uh, he, Worley Alves? Yeah. Did he beat Worley Alves, right? He, uh, no, oh, that was uh, Kraus. That, beat. that was Kraus. Nope, Kraus no, no, did no, not Krause beat Kraus beat Sergio Marais. Yeah. yeah. They fought already. He already beat him. Yes, it was Worley Alves. Yeah. Yes. So, anyway, two, uh, he submitted him uh, after. I thought that was a, a low-key, pretty impressive performance. Kind of got not pieced up, but not do- – he lost the first round. He definitely lost the first round. Sure. Came back and submitted Worley Alves in enemy territory. Calls out Michael Chiesa. I don't think he gets that fight. Uh, but we'll start with Charles Oliveira. What did you think of his performance? I can't. I don't believe Jared Gordon was ranked going into that fight. Like I said, Charles Oliveira is on this very impressive win of stoppages and bonuses, calling for top fifteen opponents. He wins. He calls out Conor McGregor. He calls out Habib, and he calls out Paul Felder, the last man to beat him. Uh, what did you make of his performance, and where do you like to see him going forward? I mean, his, his performance was excellent. It, it was absolutely excellent. I I'm really want to see him fight a top fifteen guy now. At this point, you have to. Like he's smashing everybody, and it, and he hasn't seen the the second half of the second round in a very long time. Like he's he's just bulldozed through his his last six opponents, all finishes, the last two being knockouts. You, you know, you see his hands improving. You see like he his his uh very well noted issues on the scale have seen yep. dissipated. Like he's he he's making weight consistently. Like there's really no knock against this guy. There's no reason why he shouldn't be uh, fighting in more high profile matches at this point. You got to give him a top fifteen guy. Uh, I mean that you talk about a guy who uh, beforehand, like you think about the the um, Cowboy Cerrone fight. You think about uh, what's the one where he I think it was Cub Swanson where he took like that body shot and he doubled back and and just yeah. fell kind of yeah. randomly. Uh, he had like the that weird stoppage against Max Holloway where he got hit in the throat. <laughs> so, so you've seen him falter on these odd sequences in striking, and now you see him timing these right hands with with expert precision and, and putting Gordon out. Like, dude, like with the last, the Nick Litz fight, the last one, didn't that 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 finishing sequence start with a head kick? Like something like that. Yeah, like you got to give this guy something. Like you know he's going to be exciting. You know he's going to he's going to fight for a finish. Um, he. A, kind of a weird dude that's entertaining to, to just watch. Um, those glasses look pretty cool. Oh, Throw yeah. him in there, man. Give, give him a top 15 guy. 
So looking at the lightweight rankings right now, some matchups. He, Islam Makhachev is out there. Alexander Hernandez is sitting at, there at 14, 15. Charles Oliveira is 13. Gregor Gillespie is 12. I mean, that's a really fun fight if you if you like grappling because uh, I don't think Charles Oliveira is really facing an elite wrestler and Gregor Gillespie hasn't fought a, a high-level black belt yet, but I don't think Gregor Gillespie is coming back anytime soon after that head kick knockout to Kevin Lee. Anthony Pettis is now welterweight. Edson Barbosa, Ali Quinta, Kevin Lee, Dan Hooker. Felder. I mean, the Felder fight is fun, but Felder probably won't take that. So if, of all these, and then I, then there's the, the top five, like Cowboy will probably fight Connor. Gaethje's going to, there's no way he fights Gaethje. And then Ferguson, no. Poirier, Habib, none of those guys are going to fight Charles Oliveira. So of, all, of these names I mentioned, who do you like? I mean, I like the Charles Oliveira, maybe Dan Hooker fight and that, that, that New Zealand card, that Auckland card they just announced. Maybe that'd be a fun one. Kevin Lee, Dan Hooker would be a good one. Ally Quinta, Charles Oliveira. I like the Gregor Gillespie fight. I just don't think it happens. Kevin Lee said he wants to fight Islam Makachev in Moscow of all places. So who knows? Uh, but of those names I mentioned, who do you, who do you like Charles Oliveira facing? Um, I I kind of like an Edson Barbosa fight mm-hmm. just just for the the pure style of it. That that would just be the the weirdest uh, matchup of of guys who who have wilted under pressure in different circumstances. Just it, just see what would happen. It just seems very combustible. But if we're gonna go with the old Joe Silva winners fight winners approach, I'm gonna echo the sentiments of my homie Ben Duffy at, at Sure Dog. Uh, who is high on a Kevin Lee fight uh, with, with Charles Oliveira? So um, I'll go. I'll go Kevin Lee. That probably makes the most sense. I like that fight a lot. I know if K- Kevin Lee really wants to fight Islam Makhachev just because of the ties to Habib, maybe he. I think he's going to want to try and to catapult himself closer to a title fight by beating Habib's friend and quote unquote brother. Uh, but I'll watch Charles Oliveira fight anyway. I'll watch Charles Oliveira fight a door. I know I use that expression <laughs> a lot to fight, but uh, exciting cat. The, the I really on tough. Yes, dude, that's that door stairs, no chances. Uh, but uh, uh, another guy that this question asks is Randy Brown, big win over Worley Alvarez. Where do you see him going forward? He called out Michael Chiesa, so he wants to test his uh, jujitsu against Chiesa. I don't think that fight happens. Uh, maybe he could get the winner. I know Vicente Luque's out there. Uh, Vicente Luque's coming off that loss to Steven Thompson. He's sitting at 13. Uh, but he wants to take some time off to kind of regroup after that Wonder Boy loss. Gilbert Burns really wants a fight. I don't know if you follow him on Twitter. It seems like every yeah, he... every card, every injury, anything happens. He's like, I'll do it. I'll do it. So Gilbert Burns versus Randy Brown. Just book it. Give them both what they yeah, want. Yeah, just do, just do it because Gilbert Burns was calling on Francis Ngannou like a couple days oh, yeah. ago. So let's yeah, let's just keep <laughs> Gilbert Burns alive. Let, let, let him and Randy Brown fight. I, I like that a lot. Yeah, so Gilbert Burns, high-level black belt. Randy Brown wants to test his jiu-jitsu against a high-level black belt. There you go. You're welcome. You're welcome, Sean Shelby and, uh, and Mick Mayer. And we just did your jobs for you. Moving right along. From Eduardo Breno, what's next for Jacare? Should Jacare go back to 185, retire, take another fight at 205? So, as we kind of mentioned uh, in the last in the la- one of the last few questions is... Jacare Souza, his fight against Jan Blackwood's not the most exciting. Not the most. If you're if you're one of those fans, that's like you're the only one in your friend group that really likes MMA, and you invite all your friends over, and they sit down and they watch this fight, and they're like, "This is what you like to watch." Just a couple of guys <laughs> pushing each other. I'm sure you've had that experience. I've had that experience. Uh, same thing with boxing. When you watch any Floyd Mayweather fight, people go, "This is the best boxer of all time." I'm like, "Yeah, look, he's not getting hit at all." Like, they just want to see clanging and banging guys inside that ring or octagon. But uh, Jacare came up short, uh, said that any close fight, he's guaranteed he's going to lose because he never gets those the Kevin Gaslam fights up there uh, where he came up short. I mean, he lost to Robert Whitaker pretty definitively, uh, lost to uh, uh, Jack Hermanson, and now he loses to Jan Blakovic in his light heavyweight debut. What did you make of his performance, and what would you like to see uh, Jacare do going forward? Um, I mean, I don't see any point in going back to 185. Right. I don't really think there's there's much for him in that division. Um, I don't. I mean, at 205. I mean, it's it's a thin enough division where you you might be able to pull a, a name out. Maybe, you know what? Let's let run it back with uh, Luke Rockhold. If Luke Rockhold uh, decides that he wants sure. to keep fighting, sure. You know that was a great fight in Strike Force. Um, I don't I don't mind seeing that one again. And it's two guys who probably should be looking toward other avenues. Uh, to, to the next chapter in their lives, so, yeah, throw it together. That's fine with me. Maybe even, um, maybe even Chris Wyman. Okay, uh, so just if, a, if, just if, a, if 
just a middleweight yeah. fight at light heavyweight? Yeah, pretty much. That's that's sort of what, what I'm thinking of. Like that. Um, I now I'll, I'll put this in proper context because that was a really really boring fight. And I say that as a guy who is a staunch defender of Woodley Thompson too. Yeah. Like that was that was bad. Like that that was that was woefully bad. Um, for and and for Jan Blakovich, man, what terrible timing to to have a fight like that. The 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 performances he's been putting on, the the exciting fights, win or lose that he's been in lately, for him to now get this main event against a marquee name and to fall short in the entertainment department so far and barely win the fight at that. Um, when you, you know when you're at the end of your career and you're you're trying to get that John Jones sweepstake money, um, it's just just kind of not the the best timing. But for Jacare, yeah, give him a middleweight who's also moving up. Yeah, I'm just looking at the rankings right now. Jacare Souza is sitting there at 15, even though we, he's 0 and 1 in the division. The guy right above him, Nikita Krylov, Misha Serkinov, Eli Latifi is moving up to heavyweight. Johnny Walker's there, so I don't think you'll find any of those guys. Uh, so maybe if they want to just do the obvious Jacare versus Krylov fight, I mean, I'm sure they'll go yeah. back to Brazil sometime soon. Maybe they want to go back to Moscow. Maybe Jacare gets tossed uh, or in St. Petersburg, wherever gets tossed somewhere over there. Who knows? Uh, but not the best performance from Jacare Souza, especially because you see a lot of these middleweights going up in weight, cla- weight like um, like the Tiago Santos, Anthony Smiths, uh, these guys that are finding new life at middleweight and then they go on this run and they get these title shots uh but what i was i I spoke to the i was speaking with pizza carol about this last week uh with these middleweights going up it seems like chris weidman and luke rockhold when they went up from middleweight to light heavyweight if they had won there's no question they would fight john jones next there's no question they both have chris weidman and john jones have always wanted to fight luke rockhold uh has the history with dc he's talking the good talk and chris weidman same thing those two guys lost very violently, like quick. And all week, the, all the questions were, well, wait, when you win, are you going to fight John Jones? When you win, are you going to fight John Jones? Can you remember anyone asking Anthony Smith or Tiago Santos those questions when they went up to light heavyweight? Because I can't. They were, Absolutely they, not. They went up there with nothing to lose. I believe Tiago Santos, he, it was a short notice fight, and then he won and so impressively. He just stayed in the division. Uh, I believe it, I can't remember who he, who he beat, but he just went on this tear. Uh, he had that crazy Jimmy Manuel fight. He beat John Blockovitz. Uh, was it Eric Anders that he pieced up? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Eric Anders, like it was, uh, yeah. And even and Anthony Smith was a journeyman before yeah. going up to light heavyweight. He he was a guy who nobody ever really thought of as anything but like a like a prelim filler. Um, right. You know, he he had like a Phil in at Bellator. Like he just wasn't a guy that anybody was watching, and now. You know, he he goes up a weight class and and he's something to, to to tangle with. And these and those two guys didn't have anything to lose. They went up and no one thought they were going to fight for a title. And all of a sudden, they strung together a bunch of uber impressive wins and they're fighting for a championship. The opposite was with Luke Rockhold and Wyman, where maybe I don't I can't speak to what they were thinking about. Maybe they did look past their opponents. I know Luke Rockhold looked past looked past John Blakovitz because we interviewed him at UFC 239, and he's like, "Come on, guys, I'm fighting Jan Blakovitz." Like. Come on, like who am I yeah. actually like? He who he lost to Tiago Santos, who was a failed middleweight, and then he's calling out Anthony Smith and this and that, and you saw what happened. Got his bra joking, jaw jaw broken in the second round against Jan Blakovic, who's not historically a knockout artist, and then Wyman gets uh, KO'd by Dominic Reyes. I can't, I don't know what Jacare Souza was thinking. I don't know if you read our the our piece that our own Guillermo Cruz had, where Jacare was like crying on his way to the gym before his last fight he was he felt depression and he he didn't know if he wanted to keep fighting anymore like he felt like he the joy of fighting left him and he was dry it was before his uh uh hermanson fight where he would be like driving to the gym and he would have like tears rolling down his cheeks and this and that and i'm like when i hear that i'd never like telling fighters to hang it up unless it's like a, after a bunch of crazy KOs but if you're crying on the way to the gym and you can't get your head on yeah. straight when you're about to go fist fight another human being Maybe it is time to hang up the four ounce gloves. Yeah, I, I think of um, some of the jobs I've had over the years, and um, as much as I've hated a lot of them, I was never crying on my way to work. So, right. yeah, it might it might be time to to look at the next chapter. Maybe uh, maybe he needs to hit up Luke and and see if he can get on a model shoot or something. But <laughs> yeah, he, I mean, yeah, he he may not want to be in the cage if that's a, that's his mentality right and now. How old is Jacare Souza? What thirty nine, forty? He's he's somewhere. Uh, I think he's 39 yeah so it's not like 
I'm sure cutting his weight to 185 did not help his uh, future in the UFC, de- depleting his body like that over and over and over and over. But uh, again, I don't like telling anyone to retire or what to do with their career. But again, if you're crying on your way, uh, someone says, Eduardo Bueno says, I think Robert Whitaker took his soul. Uh, Doc Doc says his decline has been obvious for a while now, but in his last two fights, he's looked like a different fighter. No shame in losing to Jack or Jan, but the way he is fighting in those two bouts made me think, what the hell happened to Jacare? He used to be such a vicious killer, and that and that was dangerous er- everywhere. It pains me to see him looking washed up like this. I don't know if he's washed up. It was his first fight at 205, and he's fighting a guy that's already in the top five. So again, nothing to hang your head at. But you remember that Chris Weidman fight? He knocks Chris Weidman dead. I mean, people talk about Jacques Ray being this elite jiu-jitsu practitioner, which he is, but he knocked Weidman dead. He knocked out Derek Brunson in that Charlotte card. So I don't disagree. It's very weird to see uh, Jacques Ray having these uh, boring decisions after seeing him just murder people in the octagon of the cage for so long. But but I think it's also, too, important to remember that styles do make fights. and. Yep. Just the the way these two happen to co- co- in, um, uh, coincide with one another, just it just wasn't fun to watch. <laughs> it just happens like that every so often. And yeah, that it's just like you know, for Jacare to say like he didn't experience the joy in fighting, neither did we Saturday. So. <laughs> Cold blooded. All right. Yeah, that, that was that was pretty mean. I'm sorry, Jock. <laughs> <laughs> Moving along from SJY, longtime commenter. Oh God, the co- Ugh. I haven't even read the question, but the 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 subject of this question is electrified fences. So buckle in. Okay. Last All weekend's right. main event was a snooze fest. What what rule changes could be made to encourage action? I would love to see an electrified fence, but I know that's not going to happen anytime soon. Seriously, other combat sports try to encourage action. EBI has overtime rules. Wrestling has riding time and touch falls. Uh, kickboxing encourages minimum kicks per round. Glory doesn't allow a maintained clinch. Taekwondo has different point system, head kick and body kicks. What are your thoughts? So first of all, no on the electrified fences. I mean, it would be... Would it be would interesting? Watch. Would I watch it? <laughs> yes. Would it bring a lot more eyeballs to the UFC? Without a doubt. But again, Those eyeballs would have badges. Like that's not that's going to get shut. Down. So the first fight when the first guy his hearts. Yeah, his hearts. He's gonna get like someone's gonna have like a heart problem. He's gonna get touched the fence, and then we have a, our first death inside the octagon. So no, I don't want to see electrified fences whatsoever. But. Uh, Anthony, were there any rule changes that you would want to see uh, in the in UFC or mixed martial arts in general to counteract these "quote unquote" snooze fests, as SJY calls it? I don't know if it'll be the biggest um, the the biggest medicine for this sort of snooze fest that uh, Jacare and Blakovich was, um, but one thing that needs to be eliminated from the rule book: there should not be a such thing as an illegal upkick. That should not exist. If, if you if you have your back on the ground, you should be able to kick someone in the face no matter where they are. That's uh that that's the first rule I change. I don't disagree with you. Uh, there's I thought soccer kicks should be allowed for a long time until I heard uh, someone what was it compared to like what if you're stuck against the fence like you're pinned against the fence right. someone head kicks you and your head like is stuck. Don't like that. Um. I don't like, I don't personally care, like, stand-ups or whatever, I don't, that, the fact that they exist don't bother me, I, it's like the least of my concerns, but I don't, if you can't get a grown man off you, you shouldn't be, you're yeah. not going to be champion, if, if Ben Askren yeah, is your literally, fault. Yeah. yeah, if Ben Askren is just holding you, and like making you slap yourself like an older brother, like, and the referees, like, you're just waiting for the referee to stand you up, like, don't, no, that's not a champion, championship mentality, like, get up <laughs> if you can't get up you're not gonna win like if that if you're if that fight's in jail you have a new dad that's pretty much how it is, is that, i believe that's how danny castillo called it when he beat tony ferguson he's like if that fight was in jail he'd have a new father right now i'm like oh god that's a little extreme i think the correct the correct term is daddy uh, okay that- thank you thank you <laughs> thank you for that that correction uh one of the comments in reply says, uh, "Pride, Pride had ropes, which is pretty good for pushing the action. You couldn't hold your opponent against the fence, and didn't want to stay in the ropes because you risked to be accidentally thrown out of the ring." I love watching MMA in the ring, but I like it as an attraction, like in the Ryzen fights where they have like some some of the fights are inside the ring. I like, I do love Pride, 
But I like the octagon or the Bellator cage or whatever you or the Kombache cage. I can't remember what they called it, but uh, I like the cage better. I love watching MMA in a ring. I love watching kickboxing and Muay Thai in rings, but I don't want MMA in a ring all of the time. I love I I like it as an attraction. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I think the cage. I mean, maybe it's just. Um... Maybe it's just more more so what we've been conditioned to accept, but I really like seeing a cage. I just it just feels right, you know, and, and seeing a ring feels like it feels fun, but it doesn't feel like something that should be the norm. And and, and also also too, like the, the ring, like the of course you, you, you wanna keep guys, um if you're in the ring you may you may not want to hang up by the rope so you don't accidentally get thrown out, but that's a humongous safety hazard for such a dynamic sport like i don't it's it's already dangerous enough i, I don't think we need to add the element of falling out and now the, the guy who's suggesting the electric fences he's gonna like uh, bring in art davies uh moat with the alligators or yeah, something yeah, next yeah. so if you fall off the ring you get your arm bitten off like like no nah, no nah, let's just cage is fine i'm okay with the cage one of the comments uh, said an up kick will lead to someone's nose getting rammed into their brain just wait Yes, I watched the last Boy Scout the other day, and yes, totally verified. Wow, uh, someone says in Pride you can go down, you get kicks in the head. Uh, the soccer stomps were cool looking. I mean, we've all seen those the, those those photos and videos of Shogun like jumping up and like double stomping people, like passing guard with foot stomps. Or Mark Hunt did his butt drop on Vanderlei Silva, I think it was. So I did ask a lot of fighters at UFC. I want to say two twenty six. I asked every single fighter in media day, like, what would you, what rules would you want to bring back? Because this was right around when uh, uh, Stephen Thompson lost to Darren Till and he hurt his knee and he said he didn't want that right. that oblique the kick to, to, the, to the top yeah. of the knee. All of them, every single, Emily Whitmire agreed with uh, Stephen Thompson, but every single fighter says, yeah, just bring everything in. He want they wanted every single rule allowed. Uh, Chuck Liddell wanted uh, knees to grounded opponents. That's or knees to the head of grounded opponents. Uh, he said that was the big one that really affected his game plan because he could like take someone down and just yeah, knee them and, out and yeah. yeah, just drill their head in with a bunch of knees. Uh, BJ Penn, same thing. He, BJ Penn wasn't a fan of the people putting hands on the ground, and so you couldn't knee them. Uh, which you saw John Dotson do. Yeah. I can't remember which fight, but it was yeah, one of the B first. Yeah, BJ Penn few. doesn't have too many restrictions when it comes to fighting in general. No, so let's not. just like not take his word into account. Uh, he does. Uh, Khalil Roundtree obviously was like all about soccer kicks if he has a soccer kick win. Even Brad Tavares was like, yeah, soccer kicks should be allowed. And I don't know if you remember, Brad Tavares got knocked. I think it was the Seth Bozinski fight on Tough. He got like head kicks. Yeah, yeah, and I he, that. He, yeah. Lost, he won by like DQ. He's like, yeah, of course I want them because I won that fight by <laughs> DQ. Uh, Israel Adesanya was like, absolutely. Even Gokan Saki was there. He was like, of course, it's it's a it's a fantastic technique. And Gokan Saki is one of the best kickboxers of all time. If he thinks they're good to go, they're good to go. Uh, but again, Emily Whitmire, Stephen Thompson, I believe, were the only fighters that didn't want that side. Even Dwayne Lugwood was like, uh, he gets it, he gets it. You get Stephen Thompson's argument, but. It's a fight. Uh, just don't kill a human being. That's all pretty much every, everyone was saying. Like, I remember when John Jones first introduced that uh, to, to that like kick. the general MMA world, and I think it was against Rampage. Rampage was saying he's had like permanent knee issues yeah. as a result of that fight. Um, and, and then uh, you remember this. I want to say it was at 239, uh, was it? where Was that the Santos or was that 235? Uh... For which one? Uh, that Tiago Santos was two thirty nine. Yeah. So remember, at, I don't. I think it was like toward the end of the fourth round or beginning of the fifth, when Jones did like that ridiculous like jumping sidekick, aiming right for Santos's knee, and, and Santos like got out of the way in the, at, at the last second. Like that's just evil. That's that's evil. Legal, but evil. Especially uh, considering. Uh, Looking at that fight now, Tiago Santos basically blew both of his knees out in the first round, and now he's getting oblique kicked by John Jones. Like God, and that not Jesus. just oblique kick, like that. I mean, that was like that was like Jackie Chan, you know, cinematic style. Except right. I'm gonna aim to the knee. So that, that was that was me, bro. Someone in the YouTube comments says MMA should happen in an empty swimming pool. No, thank you. <laughs> Or, or it was the, the basketball court theory that Joe Rogan wants. Oh, no, like, doesn't he want it in, like, a football field with no gloves or anything yeah, like that? Yeah, something, something like that, like just some big open field. Just just add weapons. Or what did uh, 
What did someone at? I remember I was at a, a press conference and someone was asking all the fighters, like, what would you think of a 10 minute round, like a 10 minute first round, which I like. Uh, George St. Pierre was like big in favor, and Vanderlei Silva was like, let's just fight to the death. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> of course you would. Of course you would say that. <laughs> but moving along from Jay's store on the, on the, and again, people just tuning in now, you can leave your questions on the site. You can leave your questions uh, in the comment section on the site. You can use hashtag the ASA on Twitter. I will get to Twitter, I promise. Uh, but for now, we're on the site. From Jay's store, are crossover rules the way to market a crossover fight? Interesting. Part of the intrigue with Maymac was whether Mayweather was still had still had at age 40 after a two and a half year layoff. Fans seem to accept that MMA fighters will win MMA matches and boxers will win boxing matches. Given recent buzz about crossover fights, is a rules mix up what these fights need to sell? In my view, the rules don't need to make perfect sense. They just need to give the media and fans something to speculate about before fights. What sort of rule set would you propose for a boxing MMA crossover? Interesting. Uh, so I believe this has happened before, isn't it? Didn't uh, Shinya Aoki have a fight like this where he fought like a kickboxer? In I think it was like Dream so. or Pride. I can't quite remember. Uh, but like the first round was kickboxing, and then the second round yeah. was was like yeah, was grappling. Yeah, we've seen like like K one do some things like that, and then also I mean really the Ali and Noki fight was was yeah. sort of like that where they they took away a lot of a lot of rules that we would consider essential. Now I'm. I mean, I'm not mad at it because if we're if we're already getting ridiculous to the point where boxers and MMA fighters are, are challenging each other every other day in these completely nonsensical matchups, okay, let's the rules can be not well. Like, all right, whatever. Um, I, I would say maybe you take away if you take away leg kicks, that would be something that a, that a could benefit from. Um, maybe you you take away certain sort of takedowns. Um, maybe you have limited clinching like uh, like K1 might have where like you're allowed, you know, three seconds to throw a knee or something like that. And then the clinch breaks up. Um, you could do things like that to mix it up. I don't know who would want to do that, though. Like what? Like unless you get a pay- crazy amount of money or you just you're that like, yeah. I, I can't I cannot remember who Inoki fought, but it was like this high level kickboxer it was like the first round was. But then this fight was such was so fascinating because the first round was going to be straight kickboxing. And the second round, I believe, was MMA. So in kickboxing, obviously, when you fall, you get separated. So Inoki was just, or Inoki, uh, Shinya Aoki was just throwing his himself around. Like he would fall down, so he would, and then the ref would stand it up, and you could see everyone getting pissed because Aoki is doing his thing as, as being like the bad guy of MMA, where he'd like throw a jumping sidekick and then just like fall down, or he would like trip. So basically, he just did everything he could not to kickbox this guy. And then right away in the second round, he like comes out. He's like, "I'm gonna take this guy down," and the guy just like knees him in the face and knocks him dead in like the first thirty <laughs> seconds. So I remember that fight because of that. So we'll get maybe we'll get crazy moments like that, or but who knows? Uh, I would like to see. It's just hard with takedowns, man. Like you could make just a gentleman's agreement not to t- do takedowns, but I don't know if there's because then if there's no takedowns, it's just kickboxing. You know, maybe you have what? a. Yeah, I mean, maybe you can you can take away like clinch takedowns, like um, you know, take out like judo yeah. tosses or something. Yeah, you, you know, because that's one of those things where like if you don't know how to break fall, you're getting messed up really bad. Like yeah. that's a that's a very painful thing if you don't know how to how to break fall. So that's something that that, that like um a, a striker would would benefit from just knowing that they're not going to get their ribs cracked because they don't know how to slam their arm perfectly perpendicular angle. <laughs> when, when they hit the floor or you'll knock themselves out like uh jared was it jared brooks that knocked himself out against uh shorty torres uh yeah i was also i think gray Minner uh knocking himself out also oh, but that yeah, was yeah. that was a wrestling takedown but yeah but yeah yeah that's you you understand the, the the point there so i would i would um i mean i'm okay with it because it's such a ridiculous situation it's like we can't we we can't like um have these these farcical fights and then get mad at the rule set, and then and then get mad that something farcical is happening around it because it is a farce in general. So, all right, go go sell it full on, hundred percent farce. Let's do it. And didn't uh, Tim Sylvia and who was it? Um, who did he? Uh, he Ray he Mercer. Had, Ray Mercer. That's who it was. Yeah. He had that. I mean, they had that gentleman's agreement, right, where they weren't going to kick. It was just going to be. Punching. And Sylvia broke it in the first two seconds and got got his head cracked as a result. Yeah. Oh God! But uh, I can't think like maybe the clinching thing. Maybe you could limit number of takedowns. I don't know. It's it's just hard when you like when you limit when you take MMA fighters. Like I know even Demetrius Johnson said, "I'll fight 
Floyd Mayweather, and I will only punch. I promise you I will only punch. So, again, I think it's going to have to be a gentleman's agreement type thing. I don't think anyone is going to allow, unless they just make a new hybrid sport. Like, what's that fight that, oh, man, what's that? What, like karate combat or something like that? Or What's going on now? God, it's good. Is he, there's, like, headbutts are allowed. He was just oh, on that way. The that way, yeah. Like yeah. unless you just create your own martial art like that, where headbutts and all that. Like Seth Bazinski just lost uh, to. Oh my God, I can never pronounce his name, but uh, he just lost. And uh, maybe you just create your own, create your own sport, and then that could attract people. But yeah. uh, I don't like new rule sets for exhibition fights. Like if they made Maymac, like oh, clinching is allowed and punch and elbows are allowed. We don't like that. Especially when you have Connor would just destroy. If like clinching with elbows was allowed, that fight would have lasted maybe a round because he would just tear through Floyd Mayweather. Oh, of course, of course. But you know, but as far as a gentleman's agreement goes, there's no gentleman when it comes to money. Uh, that'd go right out the window with, with, <laughs> with big dollars on the line. So it's yeah. not, if it's not in the rules, it's not illegal. So hey, you're gonna get that money. Yeah, you're telling me the winner gets more money, so Con- they make a dome of agreement yeah. not to kick, and Conor McGregor doesn't just come out there and throw a crazy spinning wheel kick to get on the highlights across oh. the world and make more money? Like, yeah. Come on, guys. Remember that? Yeah, like, I'm taking a bag. Remember that whole, like, leading up to Maymac? People were like, I bet Conor throws a wheel kick right away and just misses Mayweather on purpose. And I was like, what are you guys talking yeah. about? That's not going to happen. Well, I think mean, they put it. I, I bet he would have done it, but they put it in the contract that he would lose. He would lose like a million dollars every time yeah. he tried something like that. So if it, if something like that isn't in the contract, there's no monetary penalty. Why not? <laughs> you know, you're already dealing with a, a, a complete theater of absurdity. So, all right, pull the curtain uh, back. Let's, let's work. Our own Esterlin corrects me. Let the way isn't a create your own sport. It's a Burmese sport. And I wasn't. Saying Lithuania was a creative sport, I do want to correct that. It was just like now it's it seems to be more popular than ever, kind of, kind of right now. I didn't want to. I know people in the comment section are gonna really come after me. I wasn't saying it was. Ooh, but thank you, naughty Jose. I know, I know. People hate me enough already, but I got my crystals here for positive energy. As hey, hey, don't trust the guy with friendly hair. That's the general uh, rule I have. I can't wait for UFC 230, 245 fight week. Is it 245? Yeah, uh, Mike Perry is going to be at that media day. It's going to be my first chance oh. to interact with him. <laughs> I'm sure he'll love the new color. <sighs> I mean, the comment section right now, <laughs> absolutely. People calling me all sorts of things. Um, but very long question from Marty from Nebraska on the site. It's very long, so I'll try to condense it. The, the topic is the present and future of Brazilian MMA. Hello, friends. For the last years, we saw the beginning of the end for a whole generation of Brazilian stars. Anderson Silva, the Nogueira brothers, Vandele Silva, Vitor Belfort, Leona Machida, who just fought, uh, Shogun Hua, Fabrizio Overdoom, Damian Maia, etc. Some have already left, and the rest of them are one or two fight, fights away from retirement. That's fair, because like, Machida just fought a good fight. Shogun just fought to a draw. A lot of people thought he won. Maya just submitted Ben Askren and sent him into the retirement. Uh, Anderson is still fighting, but uh, I guess the whole, like, he's going on this long tangent of the next generation was hyped so much, didn't deliver, like, Claudio Gadelia, Thomas Almeida, Charles Oliveira, Wally Alvarez, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Don't move the needle, according to Dan, Dana White. Johnny Walker, Thiago Santos, Paulo Costa, the only fighters remaining, with some chance of becoming a big star, but I don't see them winning the belt at all. I don't know how far Amanda Nunes can go in terms of star power. The worst is that this is the first time ever that I don't see young prospects inside or outside the UFC. Without results and push from Globo, the interest of MMA is quickly dying in Brazil. The card in Sao Paulo had zero media interest outside of our MMA bubble. Remember Coker making promises about a Bellator card in soccer stadium in Brazil? That is virtually impossible these days. Sorry for the long post, but my question is, what can the UFC do to change the situation? I think they have main events, main event names for one or two more years, like RDA, Junior Dos Santos, Glover Teixeira, Johnny Walker, Thiago Santos, if that's not enough. Maybe they could bring big fights even without Brazilians just to bring more eyes to the sport. Fans boo Jacare Saturday so they aren't dying for their countrymen like they used to. Fascinating question. I know our own Guillermo Cruz would probably have a better answer to this because he lives down there in Brazil. But outside of Charles Oliveira, well, he mentioned Charles Oliveira and uh, the, the next generation being hyped and not delivering. Like, we just had this long question and answer yeah. about Charles Oliveira should get a top 15 opponent. He's one of the more exciting fighters in the division. But Johnny Walker... Uh, 
stumbled against Corey Anderson. He might have been the next big star of Brazil. Uh, Paulo Costa should be fighting for the championship next if he wasn't uh, injured. And Thiago Santos, a lot of people think he beat John Jones three rounds to two. I get a lot of uh, like one, two, five, I think, is the rounds that they scored for Thiago Santos. But I don't see a lot of these up and coming. Amanda Rivas is great. She just had that big win over Mackenzie Dern. Claudia Gadella is still there. It's not like she went away. Uh, can you think of any other names? I can't off the top of your head of these Brazilian prospects that we should really be paying attention to down the road. Uh, I, really, I, I can't think of too many. I mean, Johnny Walker was 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 the obvious name, but they you know they um, just saw what happened with him against Corey Anderson. So we know a certain step up in competition wasn't going to bode well for him at, at, at this point. But I can't, and I, I think that's a big problem. That's a that's a pretty big problem. I mean, there are still some very relevant Brazilian fighters. I mean, outside of the UFC, you've got the Pitbull brothers still doing their thing. Like uh, Patricio is uh, a, a dual champion in Bellator. And, let, and let's not forget Douglas Lima. Uh, Douglas Lima as well. Yeah. So there's there there are definitely some Brazilian guys out there. But as far as the new ones, I don't, I don't know. We just. I mean, this is a problem when you have oversaturation of cards. When you have a card every week. I mean, this is the first weekend. Um, UFC free week in what, like 12 three, weeks or something like, like three that? Three months or something crazy. Yeah, yeah it's, just, it's just crazy blitz of UFC actions. So and when you have this many cards, you don't have the chance to really dwell on a, 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 a great performance that a young Brazilian fighter uh, put forth. And by the time you get to a Sao Paulo, you've got a pretty watered down card that, that doesn't really move much, much interest. So, yeah, maybe if you had a few less on the schedule, yeah, maybe you take some of the bigger stars. Uh, that aren't Brazilian down to Brazil for big fights. I mean, that that uh, strategy worked very well at UFC 193 in, in Australia to bring Ronda Rousey there. So you can try that, and that can boost a little life into into the, the general fan base. But the thing is, like, in Brazil, you know, and, and please, any Brazilians in the comments, go and correct me if I'm wrong, and uh, Gary, uh, tweet me if you think I'm wrong on this one. But uh, MMA seems to be something that's so rooted in their culture due to Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, I don't think it's something that's ever really going to go away. Uh, may, maybe it, maybe it doesn't. Um, it, it maybe it isn't uh, appointment viewing for everyone like it. It might have been for like the Anderson versus the Edor fight or something. Right. But, uh, but hey, it's it's in the fabric of of their culture, so it's it's there to stay. I've heard that the Reebok deal really did a number uh, for Brazilian fans' interest because, but back then, like you would see all the. Brazilian fighters would have their own shirts, so like fans would support that and all. But like, remember Venom and all those those the like you saw like the bonus uh, bonus eye hats and like uh, Leona Machida would have like, or something. And, yeah, yeah, and then like uh, uh, Leona Machida and Shogun would have like head and shoulders on their their hat. So they were getting <laughs> they were getting sponsored and they were really getting pushed in into the mainstream uh, as as these as these superstar athletes. And then the Reebok deal kind of did away with that. So maybe uh, businesses weren't getting behind them. They couldn't like fans couldn't go out and buy like oh I like Anderson Silva I'm gonna go buy an Anderson Silva shirt now I'm gonna go buy a Shogun Hua shirt now and so on and so forth. Uh, so I, I've heard. That has kind of that's done a number on fan interest in MMA uh, down there in Brazil. But like we're talking about superstars, like Chris Cyborg is from Brazil. It's like yes, she's in Bellator, but and Amanda Nunes, the greatest female fighter of all time, is Brazilian. Uh, When's she beat Raquel Pennington in Brazil? If I'm not mistaken, I think that was her last fight in Brazil. But she lives in America and she's on her own social media. Supporting the U.S. women's soccer team over, like, and Brazil is in the World Cup. So you see, these superstars are not even like Amanda Nunes wasn't was like perf- like favoring the U.S. women's soccer team over the uh, Brazilian soccer team at times. Probably doesn't look great if you're a Brazilian MMA fan. You see your countrymen supporting another team, but I think you hit the nail on the head where they need to bring a, a big event. They need to bring a big event that doesn't have Brazilian. Like, say, John Jones fought in Brazil. That'd probably be a very big deal. Or, like, Rose Namajunas went down to defend her championship on enemy soil against Jessica Andrade. Uh, but, yeah, they need they need something big. They need another big soccer stadium like that Cur- Curitiba show where uh, Verdum, Stipe, they had uh, mm-hmm. Cyborg made her. Was that her UFC debut on that card? Was that her second fight? She fought Leslie Smith I at, like, think 140. That was, I think that was her second fight, I, I think. Yeah, and it was like by it was like by a cut, and uh, Leslie Smith was not happy. And Anderson Silva was supposed to fight Uriah Hall on that card yeah. before he had like gallbladder. Uh, somebody tried surgery. to jump Matt Brown. 
or something like oh yeah he, didn't matt, matt brown fought damian maya right yeah yeah he fought and, maya uh, on that card did jacare fight vitor on that card I believe that was the same card. And then Rob I, yeah, Font. I believe so. that was the only like Brazilian versus Brazilian fight on yeah. that card, if I'm not mistaken. At least in on the main card. Um, I believe I, I, you know, another, another thing I, I just thought of too, like what what a uh, number event was that? What Rose uh, lost lost her title to Andrade? Uh, two thirty seven. Thirty seven. So I think they made a huge mistake with the way two thirty seven was structured. Why have Anderson Silva fight Jared Cannonier on that card? Like why not? Put him in against a name that that would have been sexier, that would have would have attracted sure. more just just fun attention. Why have you know Jose Aldo in 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 there against uh, a, against a yeah a young killer like Volkanovski? Like it's, when you bring the Brazilian stars to Brazil to die in front of everyone, <laughs> it, it, you know you, that's a good way to just stab yourself in the foot or yeah, shoot yourself in the foot. Sure, whatever uh, the phrase goes. Hey, talking about light heavyweights, Chris Weidman versus Andrew Silva three. Let's run it. Do it a third time. Why not make that? Like the third, the second fight was wonky at the end. Yeah, he won fair and square, but uh, Andrew Silva, Chris Weidman three. Let's book it. But I do think they they need one of two things. They need a crazy big stadium show that filled with all their superstars. Uh, they need and Crone Gracie needs to be on that card. Uh, Guillermo Cruz is like he needs to fight in Brazil. Like he wants that. Like imagine a Gracie. Like direct, like Hick, like Hickson's son fighting in Brazil again has to happen. They need a big stadium card, fill it up with all the Brazilian stars, throw Chrome Gracie on there, or they need to bring like a John Jones or an Israel Adesanya or someone like that down to Brazil to really uh, drum up interest for that market. Because like, like this con this 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 uh, like this commenter said, the interest in Sao Paulo apparently wasn't that big for non MMA media, but. It was a bad card anyway. So wasn't probably I, wasn't that big for American yeah. audiences either. No, th- certainly not. That was not a good a, a good card even on paper. It just wasn't really much <clears throat> much there. So no shock that that only the MMA, MMA media cared, and the MMA media barely cared about it. So. <laughs> well, Guillermo Cruz did fantastic work down there. So you can go check out all of his stuff on our site and the YouTube channel. Uh, he got uh, interviews with all the English speakers, and then had a lot of great write ups with his uh, fellow Brazilians. Uh, who didn't have translator there, so highly recommends checking out his work. But hopping over to Twitter, uh, from Gabriel Ar- Arnotovich, I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Hashtag, hashtag the A-side, you can use that on Twitter. With the welterweight title fight happening just a few weeks away, have we heard any news on Tyrone Woodley? Seems like since he lost, all he talks about, all talks of him have gone ghost. Well, first of all, it's Tyron. There's no E at the end of Tyron Woodley's first name. Uh, but last I heard, didn't wasn't Leon Edwards hinting that they offered him a fight against Tyron Woodley in the co-main event of that January card? Yeah, that's that's what I was hearing. I, I, I've heard from someone who had a little, little knowledge inside of Edwards' camp that that was being discussed so um i yeah, bet, I, I, I like that fight i lot. like that fight a ton i know uh pt carol and i talk about that fight a lot as a fight that we really we really want to see uh there's a big ufc london card coming up from from what i hear uh rob whitaker and darren till supposedly have agreed to terms via twitter they both want to fight on that card leon edwards needs He's like the man lost in all of this. Like he's on this super impressive win streak. I believe the last person he lost to is Kamaru Usman. Uh, he just beat RDA in his first main event. He's beating Gunnar Nelson, Cowboy Cerrone. He's beating guys that are impressively. Uh, and I believe he calls himself like Left Elbow Larry, and named after uh, Michael <laughs> Bisping because he dominates in the clinch with that left elbow. He needs a, a card that can get him attention. So if they want to throw him on that London card, give him a big name. I know a lot of people are going to watch Darren Till and Robert Whitaker fought, fight, so maybe he gets some of the fallout. If he, throw him in the Tyne Woodley against Leon Edwards in the co main event on that Conor McGregor card. Perfect. I like that fight in general. I like how it's a three-round fight. It's a great co-main event for that Conor McGregor fight because if there's a championship, I don't, I doubt they're going to put a championship fight on that card, especially because like, how can you justify Conor coming off a loss, headlining over uh, a title, if, if that makes sense? Right. So Ty- Leon Edwards versus Tyron Woodley, I think is an awesome co-main event for that fight card. Yeah, it, it, and for a co-main event for that Conor uh, card, it, it makes a lot of sense because y- if you can't have a champion in the co-main, and and make it justifiable. Oh, we'll put a guy who just lost his belt in there against a guy who should be fighting for a title right now. So that that just makes all the sense in the world. And then also too, from from the UFC standpoint, Leon Edwards and Tyron Woodley aren't exactly the guys that the the promotion tends to favor 
Right. So, uh, so this is kind of a way that they can kind of kind of kill off, um, you know, someone that they're that it isn't exactly always in their good graces. So, uh, makes sense on, on a lot of different angles. And then, other than that, like the welterweight, like we we talked about the weight, welterweight division earlier, but I think that BMF championship kind of I I love I love that fight. Didn't wasn't exactly what the UFC needed in terms of like rankings and stuff because Masvidal doesn't care. He just wants to fight the guy with the most numbers. Like I thought before that Nate Diaz fight happened, I thought Masvidal and Leon Edwards was a great co-main event for uh, Colby versus Kamaru, and then the mm-hmm. winner would fight the winners of those two would then fight each other for the the UFC welterweight championship of the world. But then when Nate Diaz called out Jorge Masvidal at UFC 241. I was like, all right, that's the fight. Like, I don't care. Like, I love yeah. Leon Edwards, but that's the fight. Like, Jorge Masvidal should not be fighting Leon Edwards or now he should fight Nate Diaz. And then we see that fight happen, and now we might get Nick Diaz fighting Jorge Masvidal. I'm sorry, Leon Edwards. I'm your one of your biggest advocates, but you missed the boat on Jorge Masvidal. I doubt the. I bet the winner of the Usman Covington will probably fight Masvidal or Diaz next, whoever. So if, if but like if Nick Diaz goes out there and beats Jorge Masvidal, like how are you not going to give him a titles fight? You know. You you kind of have to at that point, but that fight shouldn't happen anyway. That that fight should not really? happen. Really? Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah I'm just not. I don't want to see Nick Diaz fight right now. I, I really don't. Um, you know we've heard things about uh, about him um, mm-hmm. and his 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 physical condition uh, over over the years. Doesn't sound like a guy who who needs to be jumping in, in into a cage right now. Just doesn't. And that that interview he did just didn't do anything to assuage any of those concerns. So I, I'm okay with Nick Diaz not fighting right now, um, especially when Masvidal, Masvidal should be fighting for the welterweight title at this point. Mm-hmm. He should be um, aim for that if, if, if you're Masvidal, in, in my opinion, because you're going to get the big money regardless. I, th- I agree, but if he wants that big, big money, that Nick Diaz fight is there. Nick Diaz takes like a year to get in shape, get his life together and all that stuff. More, Masvidal, I don't know if you saw, remember well, he said he needed to get his hands checked out. Yeah, his hands were messed up. Yeah. So both of them. But, but I mean, a year? Whew. Well, if Masvidal's uh, uh, on the shelf for covering his hands and yeah. the timetable is there, make that fight. I want that fight so badly. Okay, I mean, yeah, if if you're if you're giving Nick the proper time to kind of get get himself together, then uh, all right, I'm I'm not as opposed to it. Um, and then you and got, if it takes a year, right, all right. And then co-main event, Dustin Poirier, Nick, uh, Nate Diaz, big bro- yeah, brothers on I the like card, that. teammates on the card. I mean, we put that graphic out there on MMA Fighting, and I immediately wrote like, "Shut up and take my money." This that's a card that doesn't need a title involved. Like, yes, the BMF Championship of the World is there, but Masvidal has already said hashtag one of one, so he's not giving that belt up for no one. So the Diaz oh, They'll just brother- make another one. They'll just make another one. Don't don't get it twisted, man. The, another belt will be prod- will be trotted out there, and it, it, instead of The Rock, it'll be like Ben Affleck or something who's going to hand it out. It's, it's going to be something. Mike. T- well, okay. All right, yeah, Mike, we, yeah Mike, Mike can do it. Mike can do it. Mike. I, I think well, Sam- Ma- Samuel Jackson. Samuel Jackson. Ooh, well, Masvidal said that he would get the meanest fighter belt like the mmf title i like that one yeah. but uh okay. we're, we're running up on time so we got a few random questions pcs from black aces with a rising use and undeniable performance enhancing obtained from using crystals should a new usada organization be built in order to ensure fighters safety and keep them this sport and mma clean so yes no they should not because the power of crystals will never live on forever as um, you know what I, actually you know what? I, I I heard a rumor, man. Tell me if this is true or not. Uh, supposedly, you uh, were supposed to fight on the undercard of the Smo versus Hawani, uh, but Usada said the crystals no good. Yeah, that wouldn't be fair. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, me and my me and I don't know if you've watched the show in recent years, but we kind of have Captain Crystal, aka Jared Cannonier. We're just waiting for him to get on the show. I don't know if you saw that interview after he beat Jack Hermanson. Uh, yeah. He was wearing. A crystal around his neck and Tyre Woodley's like what you got going on there he's like oh this is my pyrite it uh, wards off uh, negative energy and uh, it really helps me like train and this and that and then you go on his Instagram he's like sponsored by crystals and since then like Mac one Americani was wearing a crystal at UFC 244 fight week uh Jairzinho uh after the fight after he uh he beat Andre Arlovsky, he had a crystal around his neck he goes oh maybe it's good luck I don't know so no, they shouldn't be banned because the power of crystals will live on forever. Now people are sending us crystals. They're tweeting at me about crystals. Longtime listener Jessica uh, uh, on Twitter does a weekly breakdown before fights of like, <laughs> these are the crystals that every single fight. So no, don't ban them because they will live on forever. One final question. Sorry. 
I've been waiting for this. Go ahead. Do you have you have anything to add to our crystal talk? I, I was just gonna say, like, uh, like I'm out here doing the wrong thing. And instead of looking for the heart shaped herb, I should be looking for crystals. Uh, no, you not, appreciate that one. You're not wrong. And if Pizza Carol is here, he'd be all about this conversation right now. But last question, I want to end on kind of a fun note from Hefe01. MMA fighting staff actually doing MMA fighting. With Jose Crystal's Youngs repeatedly threatening to fly over to Ireland and fight Pizzi Scissors Carol, <laughs> it got me thinking. With current and former MMAfighting.com staff, including Luke Thomas, Ariel, etc., who would be above 500 and who would be below 500 in a round robin open weight tournament with current and former staff? Well, I would be far below 500. If I had to put my money on who would probably come out on top, it'd be Casey, a cameraman, because that dude trains like five times a day. Uh, doing all like cardio, jujitsu, kickboxing, Muay Thai. So he'd be way up there. Uh, if you ever see him like around during fight week and he's not doing anything, he's usually sitting there shadow boxing anime yeah. anyway. Sometimes he comes up and just knees me in the ribs. It's not a fun time. Luke Thomas, that dude is huge and he does he's like he's super into powerlifting and jujitsu and everything. So I'd probably put my money on those two. Uh Sean Al Shadi does jujitsu. I've seen him do it a few times. He's he'd he'd be way up there. Mark as uh, mm. as AK Lee calls him, he calls him the stone pit bull of the MMA media. I don't know if you know uh, Ishii from New Japan Pro Wrestling. He's kind of like compact and built with like 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 no neck and everything. Yeah. So he could surprise some people maybe, but I would be far below. Danny Segura uh, has been doing boxing for a while now. I'm sure he would do great, but I would be I'd be there in spirit handing out like you know how moms hand out the orange peels <laughs> after after soccer games. I would just be handing out like orange peels and crystals to everyone being like good good job luke good job casey way to hit kick that man's head off uh i doubt chuck mendenhall would uh do anything i don't know how ariel would do doesn't seem like much of a fighter uh but dress shirt i would do terribly and our new our new camp our videographer alex savis would probably kick my ass anyway so uh, there you go. <laughs> but anyway as always this has been the a side live chat and as anthony walker knows at the end of the show, you get to plug a little promo. You get to plug anything you want. Talk about fighting. Talk about crystals. Last week, it was my mom's birthday, so that was my promo. But, Anthony, the floor is yours. Whatever you want to talk about. All right, cool. Well, you can follow me on Twitter at AntWalkerMMA. Uh, the Walkout Network, my YouTube channel, check that out. You can find my work on SureDog.com. Got some good work on MMA on Point as well, that YouTube channel. Uh, but... This weekend is my baby shower. My son will be born at the end of the year and wow, uh, having congrats. a baby shower. And uh, yeah, wish, wish me luck. Uh, pray that I don't pass out because I'm scared <laughs> as hell. Sounds like you need some crystals in your life, my friend. I need some crystals, man. Um, I'm still looking for that heart-shaped herb, though. Jessica, send Anthony some crystals to relieve stress in times of uh, his baby being born. Uh, I, she listens every week, and sh she's got your back. Uh, for oh, my thank, pro you. thank you, Jessica. For my promo, why all the hate on Dragon Ball Z all of a sudden? Because... It <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a second there, Anthony. You okay? I'm good. I'm good. Okay? I'm good, man. I just didn't expect that. I'm good. I'm good. Israel Adesanya was on Air Hawaii's show and said, "What during his dance he pulled his spirit bomb out of the sky." And in my mind, I was like, "I." And then he also did the uh, the death note where he wrote Robert Whitaker's name in the book. Of course, you're obviously a huge anime fan, so you know all of this. I don't have to explain it to you, Anthony Walker. Uh, but John Jones then comments on the post saying, "This is a 30 year old dude pulling energy from his favorite TV show. I can't wait to fight this guy." And I'm just like, man, haters. Just haters just hating on all the things I enjoy, like crystals and anime. Ow, I sound like a weirdo right now. Um, but, and then all of a sudden I see on Twitter, all of these fans are split down the middle. Like, yeah, John Jones, go beat that weeb's ass. And then everyone's like, why is everyone hating on Goku? And even Bobby Green is commenting, like, Super Saiyans always win. Uh, uh, Roxanne Matafari, who's always wears the, the Saiyan wigs, is jumping into it. Uh, Alex and Sarah's big Naruto fan. So, let's just all... Let everyone enjoy what they enjoy. If you don't like anime, you don't have to. Israel Adesanya wants to pretend he's pulling a spirit bomb down a la Goku in Dragon Ball Z or Dragon Ball. Let him do it. Let's just all coexist and watch what we like. And that was my promo. But for Jose, 
that's been Anthony. I'm sure he's going to be. Actually, I know he's going to be on down the line. I'm sure he, he. I always like talking with him. I hope to see him at a future event. Who knows? Maybe we'll do another extra live A side, as uh, as Esther calls it. But this will be up on Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts. It's still on YouTube. It'll be on Megaphone. Uh, thanks for stopping by, Anthony. Uh, I always enjoy talking MMA with you. I thought you had great insight. I liked your little plug on Algermain Sterling quite a bit. Uh, but for this episode of the A side, we're out. <laughs>